At the heart of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's mission is promoting and harnessing investigator-initiated discovery science to promote treatment of heart, lung, and blood diseases. With a career that began in television in New Zealand, CIO Alistair Thompson currently has an important yet challenging mission in managing the agency's systems to reduce administrative burden on the agency's scientists and also ensure compliance around its records management. Alistair, thank you for joining us on GovCast. Very happy to be here. Where does your role fit into the overall NIH organization? So the the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is one of 27 institutes and centers within the NIH. And we talk about them being sort of body part focused, which is what we are, or disease focused like the National Cancer Institute. So we're, we're one of seven almost equals. We have our own mission, our own research program focused on our particular areas. And because we've got unique missions, it, it introduces some unique requirements for us. The things that we need to do, the kind of research we do is a little different to what others do. And so we've got to meet the need in different ways. You've always been involved in the tech and computer science field since your educational studies. Why are you now in the health field? (laughs) Well, I kind of fell into it accidentally, but then again, not. When I was in college, I actually went to school to, to study medicine. Unfortunately, I enjoyed the life at university more than I did studying. And so I didn't make it. And so I I sort of went for my second thing, which was psychology and computer science. Biology and and science has sort of been part of me from the beginning. You wouldn't quite believe it from the very eclectic career I've had. I've worked in broadcast television. I've worked in finance industry. I ran an applied research center in computer science at my alumni in, in New Zealand. I've done a lot of different things. And then in 2001, I kind of accidentally ended up at NIH and thought, oh, yeah, I was a consultant. I'll be there, as most consultants are, for one to two years. And there we are. That was 2001. It's now 2019. And I'm still here. And I'm now a federal government employee. I found my home where I'm using the knowledge I have in computer science and information technology, but coupling it with a passion that I've always had for for healthcare and biomedical research. So home for you is New Zealand. Correct. What part? I'm from the south, the cold part, but we just say it's cold to keep the riffraff out. Yeah, I come from, I'm a graduate of the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand, a place that was settled by Scots back in the 1840s who were very big on education, and that culture permeates the whole city. And so it's fairly natural for me to end up in a somewhat academic environment because that's where I grew up. Um, your involvement in government It didn't start until, you said, 2002? I was working for a small company that had a fairly big investment in a consultant company in a variety of commercial areas, and then 9-11 happened. And all that work dried up. And so the the company, Blueprint Technologies, made a, a pivot to working for government in about sort of six, nine months. And then I started working for the ERA program, the grants management system at NIH as a consultant. And there have been ever since... What do you think of the difference between the being in the private sector and now the public sector? What are some of the major culture shock, I guess, things that you could describe? So, you know, I, I'd, I'd led organizations, some fairly significant ones on the commercial side. And I, you know, knew the management tools that I had available to me. Coming into government, I sort of joke that not only do I feel like I have one arm time behind my back, I have both arms and I'm gagged and tied up in the corner. Being able to, to really compensate people when they perform extremely well. Being able to hire and fire as I need to has been a real struggle. On the other hand, it's taught me a lot too. It's taught me how to work with people to get the, the best out of them. You know, one of the things I say is to, to my staff is that you know a big part of my job is to, to figure out what they're good at and what they're not good at and avoid them doing the things they're not good at and give them the things they are good at to do. And I found with the vast majority of people, you can do that. There's a niche for them somewhere where they're passionate about it. It's something that they, because of that, they're good at. And it's something that fits with the organization. It's fairly rare that you can't find somewhere for someone. Your career has progressed during a time when technology and IT, as we know it, has exponentially evolved. You've seen the landscape before and after Y2K, basically. What are some of the major changes that have impacted the way you have done your job or you do your job right now? There are so many things. I started uh, working in IT in the the late 80s uh, in broadcast television. You know, the first computer I used there was an Apple III. That was the beginning of a computer. I remember getting a five megabyte hard drive that was split up into like 26 ABCD floppy drive simulations. And at the time, I thought, how could I ever use that much storage? 
Today at NIH, I buy data uh, data storage by the petabyte because that's the rate we're generating it. I think that data generation is one of the biggest things, and it's what's changed science so fundamentally that it's now possible to generate detailed data about whether it's about your genome and you know every base pair in your DNA from end to end, you know every three odd billion of them, or it's incredibly high resolution microscopes that go down to look at what individual parts of your cells are doing. It's just an enormous amount of data that just wasn't possible then. And obviously the ability to actually process that data. We've got a, a data set from our Transomics Precision Medicine program, which is it's the largest, most diverse genomic data set in the world. So we've now sequenced close to 150,000 people. So we know every letter of their genome from, from end to end. And we're able to run analysis on that and compare them to a, a genome standard and determine how is a particular individual different to everyone else. That's really important because uh, there are diseases where either the disease is directly related to a change in the genome, like sickle cell disease, which is just a one-letter change, but also diseases like high blood pressure, where a, a change in your DNA can change completely your reaction to fats that you eat, to exercise, to the drugs that we use to treat it. We wouldn't have known that without the ability to process that data set, which is 3.2 petabytes. It's just such a vast amount of data. You know, even, even five years ago, I probably couldn't have conceived of working with it. And yet through that data set, we're identifying things that we thought were unimportant. When they sequenced the human genome in 2000, they talked about, well, we found all the genes, the things that actually code for proteins in your body, and the rest was junk DNA. Ah, they're not so much junk anymore. That DNA is doing really important things to change how those proteins are expressed, how they actually interact in your body. And we're just peeling back the onion layer upon layer of the complexity of it. And it's all driven by data. It's all driven by IT. You need high-performance computing resources with thousands of CPU nodes to go with your 3.2 petabytes of storage in order to work with it. The corollary of that is that your average uh, researcher at a university doesn't have those kind of resources. You know, you might have them at an MIT or a Harvard, but, you know, if you're at a smaller university, particularly historically black colleges, you don't have access to that. The cloud is making such fundamental change to our science because it democratizes the data. It means that people in universities that don't come from, you know, high income areas are able to access that data and work with it in a way they've never been able to before. And that brings together brains that have, you know, been cut out of this. And it brings together perspectives that we haven't had before, a diversity. You know, TopMed is an extremely diverse data set. We want to have the most diverse researcher community working on it as well. We spoke with NIH CIO Andrea Norris on GovCast recently. She actually went into how much data NIH in general deals with on a daily basis. I mean, you even said yourself, you know, petrobytes of data. I don't even know what that is, <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like a lot. Um, <laughs> what is the importance of modernizing technology in order to be able to accomplish some of these genomic efforts? So we're constantly being pushed by the science. If we if we don't modernize our, our techniques, our infrastructure, our network, Andrew, I'm sure, talked about the upgrade they did to the, the NIH network where, you know, we had 10 gigabit connections in some places and that was enough. Today we have 100 gigabit and it's still not enough to, to move the data around that we really want to move around, particularly where we need to move it to cloud resources where we've got to compute on it. It takes a while to move 3.2 petabytes of data, but it's so fundamental to what we're doing. And so modernization, just constantly keeping up with technology is critical. We find ourselves being heavily driven by the new scientific instrumentation. I heard last week about a new microscope that's being installed in our intramural program called a confocal microscope. It generates 70 terabytes of data a week. Incredible images that go down to the subcellular level so you can see what's going on inside them. Impossible without high performance computing, impossible without large amounts of storage. And so our modernization is, to, to a degree, always trying to play catch up to where the science is driving us. Can you go into some of the IT efforts that are underway at the Institute? You mentioned 
genomic sequencing. What are the what's the technology behind that that is necessary to make that happen? So uh, there's a whole pipeline of technologies that are involved in it, which range from kind of wet lab things of of how to take the DNA out of cells, how to get them into a gene sequencer, and through an incredibly complex process, be able to identify step by step through three billion letters, what are the DNA things that are there. That actually involves attaching tiny subsets of DNA that have a, a fluorescent dye on them, making them glow and then capturing that with a camera, and then through a chemical process moving on to the next one. And doing that in parallel over hundreds of thousands of tiny segments of uh, DNA. Incredibly complicated. There's a lot of robotic automation in that. I mean, physical robots that actually move things around. But once you've generated all of that data, you're getting that data in tiny little segments. It's like someone has taken your DNA and then blown it up into these little pieces of, you know, a couple of hundred base pairs, a couple of hundred letters. We've got to then figure out how to glue them together in the right sequence. And that's a, that's a heavy computational process. Uh, requires a lot of storage. It requires a lot of CPU cores to make it work. And then once you've done that, you've just got one genome. Now you've got to go and look at all of the other ones that, that you have and uh, figure out where the differences are. Again, it's a, a highly complex statistical process requires enormous amounts of CPU, enormous amounts of storage to get there. Once you're done, it comes down to a more reasonable amount of data. The scope and the scale of it is so significant when you're talking about 150,000 people. Uh, And there are programs starting up around the world that are aiming to do a million people. You can't do it with conventional computing resources. You can't do it with even some of the best supercomputers around. You need to assemble them de novo from, uh, from things in the cloud. So with genomic sequencing, would you say that's still a priority of yours compared to a year ago, for example? You mentioned with us, actually, that it's somewhat of a disruptive health initiative. Would you still describe it as that? Very much so. So what's happening now is we're moving from sort of a a data generation phase uh, within the top med program to an analytical phase where we're moving to what we call functional genomics, whereas, okay, we've identified... All of these variations, all of those one, two, three letter changes in an individual, and we're figuring out how those are correlated to disease progression, to specific diseases, sensitivity to drugs, all of those kinds of things. But we've got to move from just understanding statistically that those exist to what is the actual impact on the body. Uh, And so that involves moving into a wet lab environment to run analyses and chemical assays, looking at how people metabolize things in different ways. And so the other part of the top med program, it's transomics, not just genomics, is to look at proteins. What are the proteins that are synthesized by that DNA and what are the variants in it? The metabolome. So what are the metabolites? When those proteins, which are basically enzymes, work on things in your body, what are the chemicals that are produced and how does that associate with things? And then how, does those, how do those variations actually impact those things and then hence your, your health, where the use of animal models becomes very, very important. So we do extensive research using zebrafish, for instance, which have a genome and, and heart, which is very similar to humans, where we actually work to create what we call knockout organisms. So it's missing a particular gene so that we can see what is the effect of that gene and what does it do for us? We, we do that fairly extensively. That's what's going to get us to real treatments because we can understand how does this work in a particular biological pathway, you know, going from protein A to protein B to protein C that results in whatever, and that gives us targets for intervention with drugs and, and other therapies. It's a, it's a pretty big shift that we're making, but it's, it's happening uh, all over the world and is beginning to become important in clinical care. So Genome England, for instance, uh, is working with the National Health Service there to actually sequence people who come in for treatment, not just for rare diseases, but more generally, so that they can actually start applying this whole genome sequencing technology to making direct treatment decisions. That's where we're heading. They're a little ahead of us because they have their, their nationalized uh, medical system and it's, some things are a little easier there. But that, that's where we're going, where someone will come into uh, a clinic, 
They'll be sequenced, we'll understand what they do, and we'll use it to tailor uh, specific drugs, specific treatments to that individual. Did you ever think you would be designing computer video and audio editing software and now dealing with sequencing genomics? Never, never would have imagined it. Uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful that I am. I sort of joke that in my days in television, I worked on this this play, uh, this show called Play School, which is kind of like Romper Room. I still have the songs from that going through my head. Uh, I used to make TV commercials to help people buy products that they didn't really need. And now look at me. I'm helping cure sickle cell disease. I'm helping understand heart disease and other things. It's just, uh, I can't describe how awesome it is. And, you know, frankly, that's why I'm still at NIH after, you know, 18 years uh, and why I don't plan on going anywhere else. Hmm. That was going to be my next question is what's next. I don't think there is a what's next quite yet. It's let's solve all these problems at NIH and overall public health. I think that's why would you want to leave? <laughs> <laughs> there are so many things, you know, so as, as, as an IT professional, I'm always looking for, you know, so what are the most interesting things in the world to do? I think I'm in the middle of them. You know, we've got such incredible programs, the Cure Sickle Cell Disease Program. So as I said, sickle cells are a one letter change in someone's DNA that causes incredible pain crises for people with sickle cell disease. They go through these peri periodic crises that are just completely debilitating, shortens their lives. We've been able to do some things to alleviate some of it. And so the lifespan for someone with sickle cell is, is expanded, but we don't have, any, have a cure yet. Well, we're getting close. I, I, we, we hesitate to use the C word for cure, but we have, uh, we have some people now who've been treated with a genetic therapy that they have no more pain crises, they have no more symptoms, and we're making progress. And so the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative is, is it's a combination of those genomic therapies, but there's a lot of data involved in it. So gene editing and, and genomic therapies are really expensive, yeah, one to two million dollars to treat a patient. Going to an insurance company and saying, hey, we'd like you to cover this, is kind of a hard sell. And so a big part of that program is, you know, very different to the genomic data, it's looking at electronic health record data. What's the total cost over the lifetime of a sickle cell patient to the healthcare system? Because if it's, you know, significantly less than one or two million dollars, then it's probably not worth doing. But we know already in some level of detail that it's a lot more than that. And so there's this whole economic analysis going on. To, to demonstrate that, yeah, this is not just an effective treatment. It's a cost-effective treatment, and it's something that, that is worth doing. What have, some, what have been some of the challenges, maybe, maybe looking over the past year and looking into the next year, for example, what have been some of the challenges that you think technology has helped to alleviate? Some of the biggest challenges is that a lot of what we have to do has to embed fairly deeply within a cloud infrastructure. And so uh, I'm sure Andrea talked about the NIH strides agreements and this innovative arrangement we have with cloud service providers. They're a game changer for us because it gives us the ability to talk directly to them, get their advice about how we're using their tools, but also provide input to them about how their tools need to evolve to better support the biomedical enterprise. The, the top med data coordinating center at the University of Washington is currently working directly with Google in order to work out how to optimize their analysis pipelines for the Google environment. Uh, and that's starting to drive Google to think about doing things in a different way in order to be able to, to help us. Engaging with those commercial providers, whether it's, it's a cloud provider or it's a, a biotech company, as we're doing in the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative, Traditionally, that's been really difficult to do through government contracting mechanisms. And so, you know, these engagements are all being done using NIH's other transaction authority, which is a bit geeky except for us, us government people. But it's a way of giving us flexibility and a way to engage with, with players that wouldn't necessarily have been interested in doing it before. That's, again, been a, a really significant change in the way we think about things. It does bring extra challenges. We, you know, come to as we've exercised it, we've come to realize that it requires a lot more program management expertise on the government side to keep everything coordinated, particularly because we're using it for these extremely complex, large projects, and that sometimes the government doesn't have those resources available. And so, 
getting access to really highly experienced project and program managers with enough background in IT and, and biomedical research to be able to to, uh, to manage it becomes a secondary barrier. And so we're now sort of looking at mechanisms. How do we get those kind of people? How do we attract them? And then we have all the hiring issues and, and things that everyone has in this, this booming economy. So where do you see emerging technologies fitting in? You discussed high-performance computing, for example, the cloud, of course. Is there anything beyond that that you foresee making a huge impact at NIH? So it's very bleeding edge, but we do see things like AI and machine learning being really significant. We have a, a program at the moment that's looking at using machine learning to classify chest CT images for people with COPD. Because believe it or not, there are uh, half a dozen different kinds of COPD and different characteristics of it that actually affect different parts of the lungs in different ways. It's really hard for a clinician to actually be able to discriminate it. But we're finding, again, this is a collaboration between computer scientists, machine learning experts, and, and, and biologists. We're able to train a machine learning model which can do that discrimination. And actually, we're hoping will enable us to design better treatments for patients with COPD. So one of the challenges we have is that a lot of the data we work with, obviously, it comes from real people. And we need to protect their privacy. But also, they've granted consent for the use of the data in specific ways. So in some cases, they say it can't be used by anyone but nonprofits, for instance, or it can only be used for cardiovascular research. And so sometimes the value of the data to the, the research community is kind of blocked by those things. This article talked about using a machine learning technique, a neural network, to take data and produce a de novo data set that had the same statistical ca characteristics as the original data set, but no issue of identifiability or anything else. It's a completely new data set. That opens up the ability to have people look at that data and find the same kinds of things is particularly important for training because bringing up the next generation of researchers is another key part of what NIH does. Uh, but it's sometimes hard for them to get access to data and to be able to use a technique like AI, ML, whatever, in fact, similar technique, techniques to what they use for deep fake videos to generate synthetic data sets can be used for training, opens up a whole new set of things that can be done for people who want to come into biomedical research and learn the techniques without necessarily having to work with real patients and real patient data. How have the modernization efforts taken into account security or the cybersecurity aspect of things? So cybersecurity is obviously woven into everything we do. I am legally accountable for the protection of that data, so we take it very, very seriously. But we also recognize that in the security triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it's not just about confidentiality. It's also about the availability of the data. You can have extremely confidential data by unplugging it from the internet, but it's not available to researchers. And so the big challenges have been how to balance that in the right way. And again, this is where the cloud has been really helpful to us. The amount of money the cloud service providers are able to invest in protecting data, in monitoring, alerting you when there's something that goes wrong and other things, dwarfs anything that I could ever spend. And so by moving things to the cloud, we can actually put it into a more secure environment that I can generally support. It doesn't mean that the cloud providers subsume my responsibility for it, but a lot of the core things that I would spend potentially millions of dollars doing, they're already doing and we're paying for it as part of our fees. I have an obligation to do the different things that, that they don't manage, but it allows me to focus on those things particularly making good risk-based decisions about making data available. You know, the Congress mandates that we share data. Uh, you know, that's the availability part of it. We've got to make the data available. So how do we do that while maintaining the confidentiality of the data, in people's individual privacy, ensuring that, that the consent that they gave for use of the data is respected? And that's where things like these AI tools are becoming increasingly useful recognizing that you cannot have a 100% secure environment, that there are going to be attempts at breaches and potentially breaches. Being able to rapidly identify them, rapidly shut things down, that, that's where a lot of the, the focus is. 
Uh, and that means we need to understand the patterns of use of the data. And science use of data is very different to what you see in, in, in other areas. And so we're going to have to explore better mechanisms for doing that using AI and ML so that we know something's going on and can very quickly shut it down. Well, you know, I, we address that there is not really a what's next for you right now, although it's going to be continuing at the at NIH. Do you ever want to get back into your com- computer animation or all those efforts that you start, that your roots really started in? Sometimes I have, usually after watching a Pixar movie, I go, that was really cool. I wish I could have been able to do that. Then I go, then I go oh, no, that's right, I'm saving people's lives. Yeah, that's and better. <laughs> it's, it's better. You know, there, there are some aspects of it that I miss. There's a, a freedom of creativity that isn't necessarily there when you're working in a government context, except that you've got to find ways around or through policies that may not be cognizant of, of our mission. I think one of our big challenges is that most security regulations are written for a general administrative kind of government function. They're not written for biomedical research. And that the most common conversation I find I have with our, our researchers on the NIH campus, they say, well, why can't I do that? And it's, well, because pretty much the government regulations say you can't. But what is it you're trying to achieve? Maybe there's other ways that we can get you to the same thing. So that requires a significant amount of creativity. And again, when you when you realize the end goal that you've gotten things, uh, it's worth it. So it, it kind of, you still kind of use your creative brain in some way in that sense. Oh, very much. It's just a different kind of creativity. Although I do find myself being invited to, you know, write little pieces for award ceremonies and other things because I'm quite good at coming up with amusing little skits and things based on my background. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> Well, multi-talented. Um, how about going back home? Do you ever get to go back home to New Zealand? Uh, we do occasionally. It's a long trip. I and, imagine. And, yeah. and, and my boss is not too enamored when I say, hey, I'd like to go for a month. So, you know, we get back occasionally. Mostly we encourage my family to come here. My, my 86-year-old mom has just finished a month-long trip visiting us. Incredible woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's hard to get back. You know, I keep in touch with what they're doing there. There's some really interesting things going on there too. They have a a very different perspective to what you have in the U.S. And I'm always looking for ways to, to sort of link U.S. researchers with New Zealand and, and uh, see if there's collaborations that we can uh, find. Health collaborations? Health research, whatever. There's a fairly significant genome program in New Zealand, particularly focused on the Maori people, the native people of New Zealand, who have a different genome. And so treatments need to be different. Again, that's, that's, we have some Pacific ancestry in, in the top med data set. We don't have anyone particularly who's mm-hmm. Maori. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you. It, this was a great interview. I was really glad to hear more about genomic sequencing and all the emerging technologies that NIH is exploring and dealing with and, of course, the challenges. So thank you. You're very welcome. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. GovCast is produced and hosted by Amy Kluber. Edited by Chris Edwards. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com. Governmentcio.com.